Good morning, afternoon or evening. Good more after eve. Whatever it is, wherever you are. Hope you're having a good one. So let's get into a tricky topic. The topic of aggression, violence, how to avoid getting beat up when you're, when you're outnumbered, transforming aggression within yourself so you can also transform potentially aggressive situations outside of yourself. Let's get into it. So what I'd like to share with you is various incidents where I was confronted with a, a potentially violent situation from other people, especially where I was outnumbered and where I managed to get myself out of that without anybody getting hurt. So what I'd like to do is tell you various anecdotes, various stories from my life, and then especially at the end, get into some potential principles about what interlinks these different situations and different experiences and potentially some takeaways that you could maybe apply to your own life and your own situations in life. So stay with me um, through the stories. So first a bit of background because the background to this is like us as males. As males we have a, an identity, a sense of self that is somewhat linked to our capacity to be aggressive, to stand up for ourselves. Uh, there's like a, the archetype of the warrior and the hunter and to be able to use aggressive energy in a constructive way for the overall good, either to provide food for the tribe or family or, or whatever and have a protective role in that tribe or family group. There's elements of uh, our identity of, as males as who we think we are and how worthy we think we are or believe we are depends somewhat on our capacity to be aggressive and sometimes actually to be violent, of, especially in uh, warlike situations. Then the question becomes, well, how do we express those qualities in these changing times? How do we create a, a healthy sense of identity as, as men and as males? And where does the whole aggressive, potentially violent energy fit in? How do we resolve that within ourselves? So an aspect of that is how do we protect ourselves, especially when dealing with a situation like where we're outnumbered or what have you, or uh, even one-to-one. -one. Is there a way out? Is there a way that we can use like a verbal martial art to talk our way out of things? So this story is from my school days when I was about, I'm guessing about 10 years old and I was walking back from school, kind of got delayed and somehow got behind the usual group of people I walked home with. I was on my own because I wasn't with my friends and I was walking home and then all of a sudden, out of one of the side streets, a group of boys came running out and they surrounded me. And they demanded to know, what team do you support, Celtic or Rangers? Now to give you a bit of the background, those were the two main football teams in Glasgow, it was Celtic and Rangers, and there was a sectarian element to it because the Protestants tended to support Rangers and Catholics tended to support Celtic. And there was quite a lot of violence between the fans of these football teams. And of course, it was never really about the football teams. It was just thugs using, looking for an excuse to be thugs. Um, and it was never really about the religion. It was just thugs looking for an excuse to be thugs and using religion. So, so there was quite a bit of violence between the supporters of these two teams. This was a loaded question with painful and unfortunate consequences for myself if I gave the wrong answer. So I was looking at, looking at these guys. So this was me, short, weedy, surrounded by a, a bunch of kids who were much bigger than me and were demanding to know what team I supported and not in a friendly way. <laughs> so. So I kind of looked at them and I thought, well, well, is there any clues from what they're wearing, what the right answer is? Because uh, Rangers was associated with the colour blue and Celtic was associated with the colour green. But looking at them, they were just a bunch of scruffy kids like me. So there wasn't any obvious answer. So I thought, well, what do I say? So it says 50-50 chance I'm going to get beat up. And if they're in a really bad mood, they might just beat me up anyway, even if I give the right answer. If they don't like the way I answer, who knows? So anyway, I thought, so what, what do I answer? 
And then I suddenly knew what to say and how to say it. So they'd asked me what team do I support, Celtic or Rangers? So what I said was, I know, my instinct was to say it loudly and boldly, I support Scotland, which was their national team. So they cheered. What else could they do? <laughs> and as they were cheering, I walked through a gap <laughs> and walked on. And, and because I'd said it strongly and boldly, you know, they had to cheer. We'll come more to principles later, but that was an interesting principle of not staying within the, um, the confines of the situation, but taking on board our own initiative and doing it boldly in such a way that shifts the energy of the situation. So you've got the initiative and to do it in such a way that is, is playful and friendly and appeals to something better in them. And so what I was doing, I was ap appealing to their national pride. That Using that kind of principle helped me shift the energy of the situation and that's why I got away free, you know. This is a story about a fight I won and felt really bad about it afterwards. This is like, again, when I was about 10 years old and I was, I was in some kind of argument with a friend of mine. There was some, there was some other, other boys there and because of this argument, they were going, oh, fight, fight, fight. And the next thing I know, I was kind of got geared up to get into a fight with this friend of mine. And so I was kind of punching away at them and he was kind of heading back and, and he did somehow half-heartedly. And he was bigger and stronger than me. <laughs> but I was determined to win. These people were egging me on. Yeah, fight, fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really determined to win. You know, I didn't want to lose, you know. And I was angry and, and all of this stuff. And, and as I say, these people were, yeah, yeah, encouraging me to fight. And, and, uh, and I was going with this. And so he kind of kind of made some kind of moves to show that, you know, he, he was surrendering. He was giving up. And so I stopped and, and says, oh, I won. And, he's, and, he's, and he kind of reluctantly says, oh, yeah, yeah, you won. And, and, and the guys who had been encouraging me to fight saying, oh, yeah, you won, yeah. And I looked at them and I realized something. The people who had been egging me on to fight this friend of mine were not my friends. He was my friend, the guy who had been fighting. But the people who were egging me on, encouraging me, were not my friends. And I could see in their enthusiasm, they were kind of gloating. I didn't recognize what it was in their faces at the time. But later on, I could put a word to it. That's gloating. They were happy that they'd, got, they'd created some strife between people. So I looked at the faces of these supporters who were encouraging me. And as I say, I could see they were kind of gloating and yeah, <laughs> a bit of a look in them. And, and I looked at my friend and I can still remember to this day the look in my friend's face. I'm 68 now and this was like when I was 10. So this was 58 years ago. And I can still see that kind of look of disappointment or um, it's, hard to, it's just hard to describe, a whole combination of feelings. But it wasn't like he was defeated in the normal sense. It was like just disappointed that a friend would want to hurt him, more like, or a friend would, would want to fight him or something within that. And it... It just kind of woke me up to the, this part of me that, that wanted to, to win it wasn't always the answer and that there was more important things than, than winning. And, and maybe friendship was sometimes more important than winning and winning the fight. So that was somehow a wake-up call for me. I was, although I was a kind of small, kind of skinny character, I was always quite feisty in a way. And so it was a real wake-up call to me to, to be careful about those impulses and more conscious of who my true friends were and that people who appear to be on my side might not actually be on my side. They're just wanting to stir up trouble and see what happens. I don't know if they really cared who won. They just wanted a show because the people who'd been egging me on, I hardly knew them. But the person I was in a fight with, I knew fairly well. 
so that felt to me like the fight I won that it wasn't a good experience. <laughs> and that's why it kind of woke me up to, well, there's something else going on here than just wanting to win and the drive to win. There's other things in life. And I had that as a visceral experience. And what are those other things? So this is the story of, um, this is my attempt to be a hero that didn't work out <laughs> very well. Though it did in an, an ironic kind of way. So I was at school school so so let's say I must have been about 14 for this so I was at school one day and I saw one guy bullying somebody I knew so I stepped in and tried to do something about it and to my horror the, <laughs> the bully turned on me so suddenly I found myself in a fist fight with this other boy and bigger than me which wasn't difficult <laughs> heavier than me you know stronger than me which wasn't difficult and so we were both just flailing away, hitting each other in the face and the head, cluelessly, thank goodness. And I remember very distinctly thinking, well, this is not very fair. I was being the good guy. I was trying to help somebody out who was being bullied. This is not right. It <laughs> looks like I'm going to lose to this guy. He's bigger and stronger than me. And then all of a sudden, something very odd happened. As I was kind of heading away at this person, okay, I'll kind of gear myself up, get really determined to win, really get determined. I suddenly realized that I could not hurt this person without hurting myself. Uh, it's like I went into a different level of consciousness of awareness. And I became aware that this person I was in a fist fight with and I were somehow deeply linked and that I could not hurt him without hurting myself and that it was impossible to hurt him without hurting myself. As this awareness was dawning on me, wherever that came from, I kind of lost enthusiasm for hitting him in the face. So I kind of began to slacken off. And he kind of began to slacken off as well. And the fight just kind of dribbled to an end. <laughs> we both just kind of stopped. And both drifted off in different directions. So that was really the end of it. And the next day when I was back at school, a friend of mine who'd witnessed this, this incident says to me, so how are you? How's, how's your face? It must be really sore today. He says, no, no. He says, well, he was, he was hitting you on the face a lot. That must be, no. I says, I, I touched my face. No, it's absolutely fine. It's like nothing happened. Oh. So there's a little bit of a woo-woo kind of moment. <laughs> so, so I came out unharmed. But anyway, it was like one of these odd experiences where it kind of built on that experience that I had with that friend. It added to my reluctance to get into a fight. <laughs> now, it's kind of ironic because I went into this other state of consciousness, this, uh, this spiritual awakening from a fist fight with another boy. And, you know, and I've done various kind of meditations over the years in different kinds of different types. But I don't remember any other time where I had this sense of, quite this sense of unity with another person. I've had senses of unity with humanity or groups of humanity. But the only time I had this sense of unity with this, another guy was the middle of this fist fight. I had suddenly this shift in consciousness. So that's, you know, going to influence how I approach things. That was a profound experience. And it was the first spiritual almost a type of experience I'd had and so it's helped to mold my character and my approach to potentially violent situations and it made me reluctant to take the route of violence. But how then do I, in a, living in a fairly rough city, how do I protect myself, especially if I'm confronted with a group of other people? Well, that's what we get to next. So this one is about verbal martial art. <laughs> I'm not sure what age I was, maybe 20s, something like that. And it was in Glasgow, kind of early evening. It was just starting to get dark, twilight. And I was walking through some of the main areas of Glasgow. And it wasn't a particularly rough area, it was just one of the main areas. And I came out of a side street onto Main Street. And there, spread across the street, was a, a group of guys, a group of young men, walking in my direction and I was right in the middle 
of the street more or less are too far out before I spotted them so I couldn't kind of quietly <laughs> disappear around a side street because when you see a, a group of young men spread across the street that's not a good sign that's a sign that they're out for trouble so I kind of looked at them and thought uh oh how do I get out of this and then I knew I had a strong impulse as to what to do so I fixed my eye on what looked like to me like the probable leader of this group of guys and I went, excuse me, mate. Yeah. And I walked towards him and I says, can you tell me the way to get to such and such street? And he says, oh, aye, you just go. And he started telling me how to get to this well-known street of Glasgow. Oh, you just go down that way. Blah, 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 blah. And as he was explaining, one of his friends from this group looked at me, he says, and with a sneering kind of look, sneering kind of tone of voice, where are you from? And that was usually the lead into trouble because <laughs> then they decide they don't like people from wherever it is you happen to be from <laughs> so <laughs> but anyway so it turned out I didn't have to answer it because the guy had been had been giving me the directions turned to him and says you shut the bleep up I'm talking and he carried on giving me directions so I said oh thanks very much and I walked on <laughs> now the thing to, to note about this was I wasn't speaking in a timid, fearful tone of voice. I mean, well, oh, can you tell me how to? So it was bold, friendly, direct. I wasn't being timid, but I wasn't being aggressive either. So I kind of brought out the better side. Again, it's this principle of bringing in initiative, but your energy. You show your initiative, but your energy with your initiative. You're not upping the aggression. You're bringing in something bold and courageous, but it's constructive, it's not destructive. So I would guess that's maybe one of the principles that's going on. But we'll talk more about principles, the principles of these things later. This next one is something similar. And this also has to do with a potential confrontation between me and a group of young men. And um, this one was actually in London, and it's very similar in some ways to the first one. So I was... I was with some friends, we'd been at a party, and they dropped me off at a bus stop, and then like maybe two or three in the morning, says you, you'll get a night bus there back to where you're living. I said, okay. So they dropped me off at this bus stop. I was standing there waiting on the bus, when what did I see? <laughs> a group of young guys coming along the road, spread right across the street. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't know this part of London. I'd never been there before. The friends had just dropped me off to get a bus there. And behind me, there was a wall, but nowhere to quietly exit to. And they could kind of see me anyway. So, so I thought, OK, let's see what's going to happen. So I was kind of stood and I kind of watched these guys getting closer. And I thought, well, well, what did I do? So I just stood and I looked. I wasn't trying to appear aggressive. Don't mess with me, and you know, because I say I'm all of five foot four, so that's not gonna come across very well. So I wasn't trying to diminish myself to, to you know, as if I'm not here, that would have not been a good signal. I just kind of stood and looked, just stand and look was the impulse. Like the feeling I got was just stand and just be there, just stand and don't do anything, just be here. And so, okay, I'll just be here. And I watched them getting closer and closer. And then at one point, one of them did something that made me rather uncomfortable. <laughs> he broke off from the group and started to run directly towards me. <laughs> and I thought, what did I do? And by this time, by the way, I'd done some martial arts. So I don't think I could have taken on a whole gang. You know, it wasn't any Bruce Lee, but, I, you know, I could sort of defend myself. So I was going to be seriously outnumbered and I wasn't that good. So that wasn't really the answer. So I just stood and I watched this guy running towards me. And, you know, it's all slow. Everything slows down in these things. So you get it's almost like slow motion, seeing this guy running towards me and feeling into, well, what did I do? Stand and look. So I did. I just stood and looked. And then it turned out the perfect thing to do was just to stand and look at this guy running at me. I hadn't changed my stance. So he'd get closer and closer. And then he, when he got really close, too close basically, he kind of stopped and boo, 
and then run back, run back to his friends. And then the whole group of them made a wide berth around me as they walked down the street and carried walking on. That was it. Later on the bus came and I got on that bus and out of there. The energy dynamics there, I'm not quite clear. My guess is because I was just standing looking and I was like neutral. It could have been that the potential combatant, especially the one that was running at me, was projecting his own fear or an, an aggression onto me. So he was seeing a mirror of himself because I was just a neutral mirror. And he saw something that scared him. It wasn't me, but it was, he saw something that... Or he maybe just thought, like the Native Americans <laughs> used to do, they thought, this person's crazy, I'm out of here. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> going to avoid it. So it's just kind of really odd that they <laughs> were spread across the street. I just look at them and they do this wide berth, you know, and I'm not a menacing guy. <laughs> and they just gave me this wide berth and walked on. <laughs> Whether I would recommend that as a tactic, I don't know. But again, there was a principle of some kind of initiative. I mean, if I'd gone into some kind of martial art type stance, that would have just escalated it, and I was seriously outnumbered. So it was a non-violent resolution to a potentially violent situation. It was like a form of verbal martial art without actually saying anything. The last one was on the theme of a bus stop, so that's another bus stop story. So I was standing in a bus stop in Glasgow area and the bus stop was on a main street. There was like a mini bus station on both sides of the street, a row of bus stops. And three guys appeared from somewhere and started walking down and you know that look about them kind of out for trouble. I got a little bit keyed up. I could just feel myself going, okay, there's something going on here. And one of them came up to me as they were walking over in my direction. One of them came up to me and says, we are from whatever town they were from, and we rule this place. So basically that was a challenge. And so I turned and looked at him and I says, well, you're welcome to it. Because <laughs> it annoyed me. <laughs> so <laughs> now his reaction was extraordinary. It's like he'd built himself up to say this, we are from blah, 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 and we rule this place. And he completely, de he completely deflated. It was like a deflated balloon. He went, he stepped back a few steps and leaned against a fence at his back, looking a bit shocked. <laughs> it reminded me of these things that they used to do in Star Trek, where they would get in a, an argument with a computer or a robot, and the thing would blow up because they would, they would try and prove to this robot that it, doesn't exist, it was not living up to its own code or whatever, and the computer or robot would blow itself up or something like that, or just short circuit. So it looked like his nervous system had short circuited because of the two conflicting bits of information he got. He'd keyed himself up, he got an aggressive response which he could not decode <laughs> in his programming. He was expecting either a a fearful response, I guess, and oh yeah, okay, or he was expecting an aggressive response that was directly combative. But he was not expecting somebody to say, you're welcome to it, even though I said it in an aggressive tone of voice. The word said, you are welcome to it, which is not <laughs> aggressive, but the tone of voice I used was aggressive. And my tone of voice says to him, if you're going to mess with me, it might be more trouble than you're expecting. So you get this conflicting message. <laughs> anyway, this situation more or less dribbled away, dribbled out, and he eventually walked away. But while he was while he was leaning against the fence, I was keyed up because this guy had basically just challenged me to a fight. So my physiology was on red alert, and if he moved, I was going to hit him. He had two other friends wandering around, so it was going to be three against three against one. So I was keyed up to hit. And I don't know if that's part of the dynamic where some instinct was telling him, this guy's keyed up. <laughs> He's not passive. He's not going to be a walkover. That was probably my post martial art phase. So I was capable of hitting pretty hard. That was in my viscerally, in my energy. 
maybe part of his instinctive self warned him about that, but his conscious mind was confused. <laughs> so anyway, so again, it's in our situation that could have been potentially violent by taking an initiative, the mixed signal of friendly but aggressive at the same time, it just dissipated it and it kind of worked out all right. This one has a similar theme of verbal contradiction, <laughs> saying something verbally that is contradicted by the energy in which it's spoken. Now this was a new year thing and you may know that in Scotland we there's a lot of celebration around, around new year and a lot of people wandering around at night. And <clears throat> so I was going home late from a party and heading home and it was a, it was a cold night, it was freezing there was some sheet ice and bits of the street and precarious to walk in some parts of it. And I got pretty near my house when I saw this big guy kind of lumbering towards me. <laughs> like, you know, like one of these big robotic characters you see in, in a movie, lumber, lumber, <laughs> like a big bear and kind of a guy. And he saw me and he said something. I couldn't quite make out what he said. But it was because he was really drunk and he was really aggressive. It was like, <laughs> and he started lumbering <laughs> directly towards me. And I thought, can I get out of here? Can I do the courageous thing and just run away? Because he's drunk, you know, who wants to get in a fight with a drunk? But no, it was kind of sheet ice. <laughs> I thought, I can't run there. I'll fall on my face or worse, you know. So, okay, I, I can't run. So I'm going to need to confront this. What do I say? What do I do? And then I suddenly knew what to say and do. And what I'd said to him was, I bellowed at him right from the belly, like the hara, as they call it in the martial arts, right from the gut, right from the belly. And what I bellowed at him was, what's the matter? Are you okay? And I actually bellowed at it. What's the matter? Are you okay? And it came right, right from the gut. And it really actually was quite aggressive as well. It was this odd mix of aggression and compassion. And I, so there was a guy lumbering towards me and I bellowed this at him. He stopped in his tracks and rocked back in his heels. You know, it's not easy to cut through somebody that's drunk and to reach them. So, but there was something visceral this thing that came out of me, woof. And uh, so he rocks back in his heels and stops, like looking dazed. And I says to him, oh, you better, you know, and I says it quite an aggressive tone, not in a meek tone. He says, oh, you have to watch here, by the way, mate, it's kind of really icy. And you know, that kind of flat, slightly aggressive, but kind of friendly tone. And then something very odd happened. Within a couple of minutes, he was sobbing, sobbing uncontrollably. And I kind of ended up leaning against the wall of a nearby house, sobbing away. And I just felt, time to move, time to go. So I mean, there was people milling about, so it was like, if he got, you know, people would come and help him if he needed it. So I wandered off. A while later, I went back just to check and see he was all right. So, because as I say, it wasn't far from my house. I went and have, had a look and he was lying face down in somebody's garden, still sobbing away. People had come up to him and were saying to me, are you okay? Oh, I'm okay, leave me alone. <clears throat> oh, just leave me alone. Oh. What that was about, I don't know, but it was just interesting that, again, that was using this odd combination of compassion, and aggression. Compassion but not meek. Compassion and friendliness. Because when I spoke to this guy it felt incredibly compassionate and energetically it was very compassionate but it was also vocally it was quite aggressive. <laughs> the words were what's the matter? Are you okay? Which is a question but it was done in a really aggressive way and it was this funny mix of aggression and compassion. Again, it was this mixed message that confused him, but got to the core of what was going on for him. 
and because he was not really unhappy about something. So anyway, that's all I could do because he was refusing help. So and the next day I looked, looked around and he was gone. And so, so again, it's this principle though of, of showing initiative and putting your own stamp on things in a way that's with, with, in line with your own real core intention. And my real core intention isn't really to hurt anybody. I'll defend myself, but I'm not really particularly wanting to hurt anybody. I've never got any value from hurting anybody. Never done me any good. Getting in, into a fight with a drunk, win or lose, wouldn't feel good. And so, you know, and letting go of feeling like God approved something. And all, just letting that go. Now, as a contrast to these stories, this is a story where I actually did hit somebody. And a serious disclaimer, I don't recommend you do this, by the way. It's not a recommendation. But it has a happy ending and it worked out for the best in the long run. So what happened was this. I was working in Glasgow. I was about 16, I reckon. And I was working in this factory in Glasgow. And so there was various other young guys working in the factory. And one of them was uh, a guy who was a football supporter, which, as I've mentioned earlier, it was often an excuse for thuggish behaviour. So one of his favourite things on a Monday when we were hanging out, having lunch together, whatever, because we all, we'd all brought our lunches in, packed lunches. And we'd be sitting together as we ate. We you know, would clear a space around the work tables and just drag our chairs up and we'd sit and chat. And he would usually come up with some thuggish story <laughs> Which, you know, which I would show lack of interest in, maybe even roll my eyes. And he wasn't getting the admiration or approval he wanted, certainly not from me. And so he was trying to tell this story to show what a tough guy he was. You know, that was his thing. And he thought that telling these thuggy stories about what he'd been up to as a supporter of his football team he followed, attacking supporters of the other team, would be impressive to us. And it obviously wasn't impressive to me. And... So I mean, this built up and built up, and um, I guess, because one day in the factory floor, he came up to me and got really in my face. I can't remember what he was saying, but he was accusing me of this or that. Now, at that time, I was a weekend hippie. So he was a weekend thug, and I was a weekend hippie. So he was probably giving me a hard time about that, maybe calling me a hippie or something like that. I don't know. God only knows. <clears throat> Verbally coming at me, blah, 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 blah. And then I suddenly saw something, and I saw it really clearly, like I really knew it viscerally. This guy is out of control. He needs a boundary, a barrier on his behavior, but something that doesn't hurt him too much, but shocks him. He needs a shock out of this mindset he's in, and he needs to be shocked out of it. And I suddenly really knew that. And I, re and I knew how to do it. So what I did was, I hit him really hard, really fast, but I punched him on the chest three times. It really surprised me how fast I moved. I had no idea I could move that fast. So it wasn't like bang, bang, bang. It was much faster than that. And this, so the next thing he knew, and the next thing I knew, he was toppling backwards. Good dunk <laughs> at the floor. Thud. <laughs> and as a bit of comic relief, one of the big guys from the factory was, you know, the older guys was, was walking past at that point and he looked down at this guy on the floor and he says to him, you weren't expecting that, were you? And walked on. <laughs> so I don't remember what happened. I might even give him a hand to help him get up or what have you because I saw he looked shocked. And like, what just happened? And so I might have helped him, but I'm not sure. Or maybe this big guy helped him up. Anyway, he got, he got up and I said something to him. You know, I can't even remember what I said, but I said something. And uh, the very odd thing was, that was the perfect thing to do because although I hit him, I didn't hit him in the face or, the, you know, I didn't go for his head. I didn't hit him somewhere where it would have damaged him. I hit him in the chest. But I did it with enough force and enough speed and impact that I knocked him over. So he, he could see that if my intention 
was to damage him, he would have been damaged. And that was what he would have done. He would have gone to damage. He would have gone out to damage somebody. If he had a chance to damage somebody, he would have damaged them. He could, uh, some have viscerally s said to him, this guy could have damaged me, but rather than damaged me, he just knocked me over. It was almost, it was like strong, it was tough, but it was playful. <laughs> and, and because I was the weekend hippie, <laughs> rather than the weekend thug, he could also see that, that I was, that was out of choice, that I was choosing my path, I was choosing a non-violent path out of choice, not out of weakness. It was a choice I was making. What happened was, not long after that, he left that factory and went to work at a factory not far away. And <laughs> what happened was odd, really odd. I would sometimes come out of the factory when it, it, and it, it closed at the time when we were, we were all leaving, and he would be there and he'd come over, ah, how are you doing? He would be wanting to chat to see how he was doing. <laughs> it's like it made a bond with him. <laughs> and he wanted to reconnect every so often. And he just wanted to be friendly and chatty. And that was great because it gave me a signal of, yeah, that was somehow the right thing to do for him. It had taught him something. I mean, he learned a respect for somebody that had a completely different approach to life than he had. And hopefully it caused him to change his approach to life and not to be such a thug. I don't recommend hitting people for the sake of teaching them a lesson. I only did it because that visceral sense of knowing, the one that had got me um, out of various scrapes in the past, and just the sense of knowing was telling me to do it as a shock and gave me a knowing of how to do it um, by hitting him on the chest. And it just seemed like I just really knew <laughs> viscerally from some part of me that was wiser and older and deeper than my normal conscious self um, was saying, do this. <laughs> it felt the right thing to do. It didn't feel like I was doing something to harm somebody or to hurt somebody. I was impelled to do the right thing. And it was bold and direct, but it wasn't an intention to hurt. It wasn't an intention to harm, but it still had the boldness and courage and direct action that that situation required. Now here's another story that's very different because it's a bit of conflict, but it's not a physical conflict or not a potential physical conflict in which the same principles came up. But I had done some work for a, a charity, a non-profit organization, and within that project, some equipment had been donated by a computer company to this nonprofit. Um, and that equipment was, computer equipment was used for the general running of this nonprofit. Later on, I had moved away from that nonprofit and I was working at a company. I was actually working at the company that donated the equipment to this nonprofit. And I got word that, that the person who had acted as the channel for that equipment who'd been the contact, because I wasn't the contact for that equipment coming into that organization, was making all sorts of claims around that the, they were sort of claiming ownership of the equipment and various rights and opportunities they were expecting. To, so I thought, well, what do I do with this? I mean, I know this guy and I know he tends to be a bit full of himself. Do I just confront him directly and say, I thought, well, what good does that do when I do it? Because he's, I'm not there, I'm physically not there he still can do whatever he's going to do. So one principle is, how can you appeal to a higher authority to bring in a higher principle or a higher authority and resolve it that way, rather than trying to deal with it personally, rather than making it a person-to-person -person issue, and deal with it on the level of principles. So how can I resolve this once and for all? <laughs> also, because if I do it as a personal thing, he could always re-emerge later doing something other nonsense. Because I was doing some contract work for the actual company that made the donation, I just says to them, can, can you just produce me a letter confirming that that equipment belongs to that nonprofit? And that, as the manager I was speaking to says, sure, just, you know, just write something up, print it out, and I'll sign it. So it was to the management of this organization just acknowledging that as the recipients of this equipment that the company hoped that were getting good benefits out of their ownership of this equipment. <laughs> 
and the manager signed it. So I sent it to the management team of that organization. That was the last I heard of it. It just completely, completely swept the rug from under this guy that was playing power games. I didn't need to get into a personal confrontation with him. I dealt with it once and for all. I gave the power to where it belonged, which was within that nonprofit. Sometimes you can resolve things without getting personal about it, dealing with a level of principles. Why get into a struggle with somebody if you don't need to? You know, like Genghis Khan used to say, the best battle is the one you don't have to fight. I mean, they were fierce warriors. They weren't afraid of, of getting into a fight and into a battle. They thought it was far better to outwit a potential opponent rather than actually have to fight them. The best battle is the one you can win without having to fight it. And that usually means outwitting your opponent or a potential opponent or not letting them really be an opponent and just working on the level of principles rather than personalities rather than getting to I'm going to show him I'm going to fix him he's wrong I can which he was this guy was wrong but rather than getting into a personal fight with him and one that would be hard to deal with because I was remote I was physically not there why bother sweep the carpet from under his feet it's done I think one of the things that sometimes drives males particularly into violence is the fear of being thought of as a coward. And there's always a certain amount of fear when a potential fight comes up. And any of the situations I've mentioned to you, I'll have a certain amount of fear going on. And my reaction to fear was to become very present, very focused in the moment, and not allow my imagination to run crazy. Be right with what's actually happening right now. And part of what was happening right now was there was a visceral, instinctive part of me, or an intuitive part of me, maybe a mixture of both, that told me what to do. And some part of me knew what to do. Because I wasn't caught up in feeling like I had to prove something, it wasn't my tendency to seek to fight with anybody. It wasn't like that just had gone away from the various experiences that I had. But there can be a tendency for, for us men to say, OK, I want to prove I'm not a coward, I better fight then. Somebody feeling fear doesn't mean they're a coward. Because you always feel fear in a fight, a potential fight. It's always there. It's just part of what's there. It's part of the physiological reaction of your body gearing up onto red alert and giving you a rush of energy to take action. Then it's a matter of channeling it into something constructive. Um, because each of these instances I've, I've told you about, were, there was always an element of fear. But it was, what do you do with it? And you hold it, contain it, come into the present moment. And what I find my reaction of fear is to really focus on who's in front of me. And I get very focused. The thing is not to get imaginative, not to get into your imagination, but to get into your focus. And that itself, I think, is maybe a form of protection. Because the person can see, potential antagonists can see, well, this person is not asleep. The, I might have <laughs> more of a struggle here than I first anticipated. And then if you can give them an easy way out of it, without them losing face, they'll take it, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> this story is a, an odd one. I guess they're all <laughs> odd in a way. <laughs> but this one particularly illustrates the importance of really listening to yourself, even if it doesn't make any sense to you at the time, and learning to trust that part of you. I was traveling on my own. I was staying along the Algarve coast, which is the southern coast of Portugal. And so I went to this club at a big long bar and good music. Gradually the place started to fill up. I was the only non-local there, so I kind of stood out. <laughs> And I was standing on my own at the bar. So you could see all the, the women there were all really dressed up and clustering together. They would move as a group <laughs> to the toilet. They would move and come back as a group. They would go up and dance as a group. They would sit down as a group. <laughs> and the guys were like on the fringes. And this was a few, some decades ago. And there was all this sexual tension in there. <laughs> all these women moving around, sort of like princesses. And the guys sort of, desperate <laughs> to get in. So there was quite a bit of tension in the air. And there was the various guys who muscle shirt, t-shirt type things on, posing, you know, about as well. A bit of that going on. 
I was standing at the bar and at one point I had my back to the bar and with my arm resting on the bar, leaning back against the bar and there was a group of local guys here and various people around the place and up people were up dancing and all this was going on. So it was quite noisy, boom, 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 boom. And um, so I was standing there and I got this really strong impulse. It was to grab hold of the bar. The bar had an edge and I was leaning against the edge to grip that edge of the bar really firmly. I says, okay, I'll grip it really, I'm gripping this bar really firmly. And I was just wondering, why should I grip the edge of this bar really firmly? And suddenly one of the Portuguese guys on this side swung around, tried to grab me by the lapels and pull me up. <laughs> but because I was clamped to the bar, he moved rather than me moved. And I just looked at him quizzically, you know. And he went, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, whatever that equivalent was, I'm sorry. <laughs> because he expected, <laughs> he was completely disconcerted because he expected to lift me up because I'm, no, I'm not a big guy. <laughs> and he expected just to, oh, sure, this non-local, he suddenly felt like he was dealing with this really heavy dude. <laughs> and it s surprised him. So he went, oh, sorry. <laughs> so back to this. Back to where he'd been, <laughs> and the rest of the night he would kind of look, kind of quizzically, <laughs> can't figure this guy out. <laughs> look, so, the moral of the story is there's the importance of listening to these odd notions of do something, do that, <laughs> and learning to when to listen to that bit of you that gets this odd notion. By all means, ask why am I doing this, but be doing it first. <laughs> so it was just really odd that I get this really strong notion. Grasp the edge of the bar firmly with your left hand. Okay. <laughs> he couldn't see my left hand. He couldn't see, you know, holding firmly to the edge of the bar. <laughs> That's what's completely disconcerted them. And then he was, you know, it left me alone the rest of the night other than funny looks. <laughs> I can't figure it like I can't figure this guy out. <laughs> so what is it about all of this? What are the principles involved in these different stories and different scenarios? And if you've got any ideas, please comment. But here's some suggestions I've noticed that one is is to make things about principles rather than personalities, not to get into unnecessary conflict but trying to resolve it on the level of principles. And sometimes that might mean appealing to higher authority rather than getting into a fight with somebody. And sometimes that's like the early story, but the, the, the football supporter story when I said, ah, I support Scotland, because that was a higher principle. You know, they put their question is, what team do you support, Celtic or Rangers, which was two local teams. And I kind of brought in, I support Scotland, which was the national team. So that was an appealing to higher authority. It was bringing a higher principle in and it was working on the level of higher principles rather than getting into personality struggle. If you get, if we get into a fight with somebody, then it's degrading the society around us. It's bringing more violence to the society around us. So the honorable thing might actually be to get the police involved rather than get into a fight. You know, and I know people, oh, that's, that's, uh, that's riding on people, blah, blah, blah. Well, the only people who say that are perpetrators of violence. It's the thugs and gangsters who want to perpetrate that lifestyle who say stuff like that, mostly. So why live by their code? Why don't you live by your code, your decision? And it creates a culture and a society that becomes less violent, where violence is an aggression against is less supported, then that's a better society. One of the fears we have is the fear of being called a coward. So sometimes the courageous thing is actually a risk the fear of being called a coward. And to do the really brave thing for society overall, which is get any kind of authority involved if necessary. I mean, only you can decide what you need to do in a given situation. Only you can decide what your own real moral code is. But sometimes, the cowardly thing is to actually 
to be afraid of what other people are going to think. The, the courageous thing is to do what is the highest and best within you want you to do. If there's anything that's cowardly, and I'm wary of the word cowardly, it's to go against that. That's your moral code. You've got to do right, what's right by you. And if your highest and best within yourself says, I need to do this for the greater good, then that's what you need to do. To be, um, even if other people think, oh, you called the police, or you called the blah, blah, or you did this, and you should confront them yourself. Nonsense, nonsense. You know, we're not Neanderthals. I think it's like about 3 or 4% of Neanderthal DNA in the average human being. Let's call it 4%. You don't want the 4% running your life. You don't want that 4% telling you how to behave, and you don't want the 4% and somebody else telling you how to behave. Another principle, I think, is to really get present in the moment in these times of crisis and see if there's something within you which has arisen to guide you. It might be a visceral physicality that's helping you be present in the moment, and then it might come as an inspiration, because often in moments of crisis are actually also spiritual crisis. It's a point where the higher aspects of yourself will intervene will try and intervene and guide you in a more positive direction than you might have gone otherwise. So these situations of threat or challenge can actually be actually a spiritual experience. They can actually be a spiritual turning point to move your life in a more positive direction than it might have been otherwise. Whereas if we get locked into the bitterness and hate and personality stuff, it can take us into a downward route. But you don't really want to go, at least I hope you don't want to go. So I think it, part of the dynamic is get a hold, get a handle on your inner Neanderthal. The aggressive, primitive part of you, let's call it your inner Neanderthal. As I say, I might be being very unfair to Neanderthals, but maybe they were nothing like that. They might have been peaceful in reality. But anyway, just get a hold of your inner Neanderthal and not let that run your life. Like the highest and best within you run your life. So that's one of the core principles is to be guided by the highest and best within you, not by your the 4% of your DNA, the inner Neanderthal. But not to suppress that aspect, allow it to be present. Because that physicality, that fear reaction, anger reaction, aggressive reaction, to not repress it, but allow it to be present, but channel it constructively. So it's not a matter of suppressing, trying to suppress fear or trying to suppress anger. You allow whatever's present to be present, but you're channeling it. You're saying, okay, I want to channel this in a good way. I want to channel this in a way where I come out of it feeling good about myself, in the sense of having the approval of the better parts of me. That's to do with, with being able to listen to yourself, all of yourself, the visceral part and the inspirational part which tends to arise in these moments of, of crisis. You've got a physiological reaction, and there's also some kind of, usually some inspiration or idea or notion will come in to help you. And another pr principle is not feeling like you've got something to prove to anybody. That if you've got to prove anything, it's you want to prove that you can live by the best within yourself, that you can live by the highest and best within yourself. Not to try and impress some woman or impress your friends or impress anybody. Impress the highest and best within yourself. That's your first and last priority. Only thing you ultimately owe any loyalty to is the highest and best within yourself. Because you have to follow what's the noblest part of yourself. And to cultivate the courage and boldness and confidence to follow that and learn to trust it. And that takes time to work with it it becomes a habit and part of the whole physicality of these challenging situations is it is an opportunity to get really present in the moment and be alive in the moment and somehow things work out something comes in something intervenes but we need to be available to listen to it and to to go with it because it's going to be something unusual and that's why it's good not to be in a, me a mental habit of fantasizing about being a Bruce Lee type or martial art hero type because 
then if you've got those kind of fantasies running, then when you're in a confrontation, a potential confrontation, those fantasies will start to play out. Those fantasies of being a martial art hero or whatever will come up and try and play out in that situation. And that's not the highest and best within yourself. That's, that's, e that's the ego fantasy stuff. Just no notice if they come up for you and don't feed them. Don't feed them energy. Don't build on that. And then there's less chance that when you, if you are confronted, then other aspects will come in and you'll be able to transform the situation rather than trying to play out your martial art fantasy, which may or may not go your way. If your inner, inner self, your highest and best within you, doesn't want you to be aggressive, doesn't want you to be in a fight with somebody, and you're listening to your fantasy self that does want to prove something, then, you know, your, your, the best within yourself doesn't operate from the assumption that you need to prove anything to anybody. <laughs> so if you tie yourself to having to prove something, you keep on having to prove it. And it becomes endless. So it doesn't lead to a, a fulfilling direction. It's better to unburden yourself <laughs> of the need to prove things. You know, if the martial art, like a martial art fantasy thing comes up, just observe it. It's like watching TV. There's the fantasy running. Me as a martial art expert doing my Bruce Lee. Okay, isn't that interesting? Be a bit bemused by it. Okay, don't be down on it. Don't trash it. Let it play, but don't feed it. Don't build it. Don't expand on it. And then it'll gradually quieten down. Joseph Campbell used to tell this story from the samurai traditions where the ethics, the moral code, was that if somebody killed their master, then it was their job to kill the person who killed their master. That was their code. That was the Bushido code that they, they operated on. And so this samurai was going after somebody who'd, who'd killed his master. He withdrew his sword, and then the, this opponent spat in his face. And the samurai got angry. So what he did was he sheathed his sword and walked away because it become personal. So it wasn't acting of duty anymore, it was, it was a personal thing. Whereas before, he'd been acting on his Bushido code. And so he didn't want it to be a personal thing. That's why he sheathed his sword and withdrew. Now, now whether that's a teaching story, or whether it actually happened, I don't know. And whether the samurai, once he'd cooled down, went back and dealt with this guy, I don't know. But it's an interesting point. So, I hope you find this useful, interesting, entertaining, this exploration to healthy masculinity and how do we relate to violent, aggressive uh, impulses and how do we transform them and how do we deal with potentially, potentially violent confrontations or conflicts with others. Come across any interesting principles or points or things you've learned in your life on this thing, please. Put it in the comments so as I can help others. Be you. Be your best. Be your best self. You're awesome. Go for it.